Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, whoever is looking to this presentation. This is the uh, main talk about QuantMS, but let me say we're using NetFlow. And um, the idea of this presentation, and also a little bit, I will be doing a little bit of, of demonstration with uh, local computers, but also HPC uh, clusters. Um, I would like to say that I'm sorry that um, uh, the final uh, cloud infrastructure didn't work so, uh, uh, for me because I have some issues moving data from local infrastructure to, to the AWS. But um, in the HPC works similar to, to, to the cloud infrastructure then I think is for the, to the, the, the presentation. Uh, today I will be talking about QuantMS. What is QuantMS and what allows you to do? Uh, first I will discuss, uh, present, present a little bit about PRI, what PRI is, SDRF. There is a full presentation associated with this talk around SDRF, the Sample Metadata Relation Trip File Format. And then I will go into details about QuantMS. What is QuantMS? Why is cl cloud-based? Uh, and what allow you to do? Proton Exchange Consortium is actually a consortium that group a lot of databases, including Massive, PRI, IPROX, and Datos. The main database of Proton Exchange is PRI. I am the team coordinator of PRI. It's stored in this database is hosted by MBL EDI and is the mayor archive. It hosted more than 80% of the data of Proton Exchange. Currently, more than 30,000 data sets are public data sets are out, out there, which actually triggered a really long, um, a really difficult problem for proteomics. I mean, we want to be able to reanalyze massively and, and, and fast our most of the public data, uh, but also in distributed environment, not in a single machine. And that's what this talk is all about. The number of data set is actually growing so fast. Uh, for example, if by 2021, we have submitted more or less almost 500 data set per month, which basically three is a lot of data that gets deposited um, uh, every month and should be available for, for, for reanalysis and re uh, We uh, There is a full presentation of the, uh, uh, about SDRF associated with this talk, and we will leave the, uh, leave the link somewhere. Um, but what, what is the SDRF? In, in Proteomics, when you deposit the data, you put only the, right now, until 2021, you put only the data files, the raw file coming from the instrument, okay, and some metadata associated with it. Title of the experiment, data protocol, sample protocol, and a short description, who are the authors, and so on. Mainly also, also result files, like for example, the files coming from the search engine or the, quanti the quantitation tool like MaxQuant, and that's it. In 2021, we released a file format that tried to describe how the samples, okay, the samples analyzed in the experiments are related with the raw file. And this actually is the SDRF, is sample to data relationship format. For every sample, you need to describe in which file is and actually the metadata around the sample. All the QuantMS is based on SDRF. It takes as an input SDRF to perform the analysis. Okay, as I said, it, because this is so important, I made another presentation associated with this one. Um, I, uh, let's talk about analysis. I mean, you, we know there is a lot of data out there. Uh, now we have with SDRF a way to describe the, the, the data. There is multiple tools in proteomics. I mean, tools go, um, um, you can see here, the most popular tool for quantitation continue to be MaxQuant. Uh, but there is others. There is OpenMS, Pattern Lab, uh, Skyline also is really popular. And in the in the in the uh, these are of, uh, uh, free for academics uh, mainly. But there is others open source some of them also. And there is the commercial ones. The commercial one, Protein Discover is really popular. Scaffold. This is actually um, a survey I did in 2019 more or less about the popularity of open source and commercial software. You can see here how Mastquan, I mean, how Mascot was for a long, long time the uh, best 
the, the most popular tool until the 2010, more or less, for analyzing proteomics, and it was taken over by Maxwell. But recently, they has been split. I mean, there is other tools that have been becoming more and more popular, like FragPy and MS Fragger. You can see here in the number of citations how, for example, MS Fragger has gained quite a lot of attention recently. This is from 2012, sorry, 20. And other search engine tools and so on has lost a little bit of attention. And how, for example, Masquan doesn't gain anything but doesn't look. Uh, lo uh, uh, lost anything. I mean, it meant it to be the main tool for uh, data analysis within the open source and freelance community. No open source, but free options for proteomics analysis. And, but I want to say something really important. The best tool is the one that works for you. I mean, the one that you are familiar with and so on. Most of this tool, and that's the purpose of this talk and also this course in general, are desktop oriented, mainly Everyone uses these tools as a monolithic tool that they have in their computer. They put their data and they analyze their data. There are some cases, I think FragPy, you can run it from the command line, extend also, but they are not oriented to distribute the OpenMS, of course, but they're not oriented to distributed environments, okay? The main focus of the tool is not to be run in a distributed environment, in the cloud, in HPC, and so on and so forth. Their main focus is to be computed in the mainframe with a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, when you can run as a whole the entire experiment. Okay? That's why we created QuantumS. QuantumS is an alternative to go to cloud and perform your experiment, but also to go to HPC, high performance computer, to basically gain some of the ideas of, or, or, or take advantage of some of the uh, uh, possibilities on the cloud environments and then uh, reuse that for proteomics analysis. Um, in 2021, I think, 22, actually, we published um, a review, which is actually here in proteomics 2020, actually, where actually we described what was the main, uh, what, what actually, ca what can be uh, a workflow in proteomics that should be basically move, how, how do you move a workflow in proteomics into cloud infrastructure? And the first step is that in a proteomics, in, in general, in general, in the in a computational proteomics analysis, you have multiple steps. For example, if it's labor free, you have feature set detection, you have the database creation, when you actually create the decoy database, you have the database search, when you actually take the spectra data and try to associate to a peptide, each, um, each, pep, each spectrum, then you apply some FDR and statistical criteria to discard peptides that are low scoring and, they, and keep the ones that are high scoring. In some cases, you, you do a second database search to actually uh, do a more accurate search of the uh, space and then apply an FDR, then you do protein inference and quantitation of the data, okay? Then this can be divided into a small steps. In any all of these monolithic tools, what they do, Quan and other tools, they group all these tools into one, in one piece of software and perform all the steps together until the downstream analysis. What actually we propose in 2020 is we should look for a more distributed approach. A distributed approach will look like this, where actually each of the steps that you want to perform is actually an individual tool that is associated with the Bioconda Docker container. And I will explain about those concepts, what those concepts are. What is a Bioconda package? What is a Biocontainer? That will allow you at the very end to take each step and perform this each step in one specific node of compute, okay? Then you perform feature detection in one, in one compute node from, for one row file, and another feature detection for the other row file in another compute, and so on and so forth every search in another compute, then you get some result, then you perform identification in the same way, FDR filter, and probably because protein inference is the step when you group all together and perform FDR and group all the peptide for every row, every sample into a big node. But all these steps can be uh, uh, do independently in different nodes. And more importantly, more importantly, it should be, uh, it should be relevant for the user where do you perform that? 
What that means is basically you don't need a computer, you don't need an installation for your uh, 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 um, personal computer, and another installation for, for example, AWS or the cloud infrastructure, and another installation for the HPC, and so on and so forth. Everything should be deployable and reusable as easy as possible with the same setup. And that's what was our vision, and that's what we try to pursue with QuantMS. QuantMS is quantitative uh, um, analysis of mass spectrometer oriented to cloud reanalysis of proteomics data. It's based on the popular um, engine or workflow engine uh, called Nextflow, and I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's DSL2, and it can perform, uh, th there's three, uh, multiple, multiple features, but one of the ma main features, it can perform three types of analysis, LFQ, DDA, label-free, data-dependent acquisition analysis, TNT analysis, and DIA analysis. The three of them can be performed with quantum mass. If you, in the future, we plan to export this to Silac, Acta, and other labeling methods, but for now, these are the three main focus because we know these are the main data sets that are out there in the public domain. The second thing is, for quantum mass, it's extremely important to be reproducible and to be uh, based on a standard file format. What that means is that the, 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 far, the file formats underlying QuantMS, all of them are a standard file format. And this is actually really important because a standard file format like MCCAT, MCML, and so on and so forth has been developed by a, by a huge community. Everyone can build their own tool to read from QuantMS or to um, process the results of QuantMS. And you don't really know, uh, need proprietary software to understand what uh, has been the output of each file, okay? Um, the input is an SDRF file format, as I explained before. This is how do you describe the sample. The raw file is an MCML. Uh, of course, we have some notes that in the quantum ed, that if you have raw file, converted to MCML, and the, and the final output is in MCCAD. Mainly in the, in the, in, in the core of, uh, of quantum ed, there is OpenMS tools, and also Diane for, to perform the analysis of data independent acquisition data. Okay, how this look like? I mean, this is a small diagram. And what would happen when you have an experiment with quantum mass? And this is, I hope you can follow me with this small uh, diagram. You have the MCML data or raw file, and you have a FASTA file. It's optional that you can generate the decoy. You can pro provide your own decoy, or you can provide um, or, or if you don't provide your decoys, you, the, the pilot will compute the decoys, uh, will calculate the decoy for you. It is also important that another input is the SDRF. The SDRF is plain actually the experimental design, is how actually quant, how QuantMS can know what is the raw file to where to send the raw file and split all the experimental design into multiple nodes of compute. Okay? Then, if you continue following, there is some a, a small step here to index the MCML because it's needed for some statistics and so on. And then you, the user can opt to use two search engines, MSDF Plus, which is an open source software, and Comet, which is another open source software. Then you can use both of them, and you will need to combine the results of them, or you can opt, uh, optional, you can use only one of them. This is actually depending of the cloud infrastructure you're using, actually. Because, for example, we know, and I will put some statistics, that Comet is actually uh, is quite fast, but consume a little bit of more memory than MSDF Plus, but M of, uh, sorry, of CPU than MSDF Plus, while MSDF Plus is quite slow, but actually, in some cases, can give you more PSM. It depends on the study. I would say, for a normal, uh, um, um, for a normal data set, you can go with Comet, it would be really fast, and you will not need to consume that much CPU uh, memory in your analysis, and you will have de decent results in terms of PSM and peptide. However, if you are going for a deep analysis, then you may need to combine both search engines and consume a little bit of more memory. You have the consensus ID, which basically combines two, the two steps. Then you have percolator on top of it, which basically percolator will try to boost the number of identifications for the results. 
I mean, what pen collector does is uh, put on top of this some support um, 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 machine learning method that take the original identification and try to, using a dif different property, try to boost the number of identification. Um, I will not go into detail there, but you can read about Percolator, how it does that and so on. Then we use, if you are doing PTM's localization, uh, uh, um, the, um, uh, PTM localization studies, then you can use uh, Lucifer to actually try to um, localize the PTM's in a better way. Then at the very end, Okay, then in here, every step is independent. And if you see every row file actually can go through all of these steps independently. However, at the very end, we have what we call like a heavy node, node. And this node, what it does is actually to perform protein inference because in the protein inference, you need to actually say the FDR for the entire process. And that is actually a heavy node. It needs more, it uses more memory than all the other steps. And actually, one of the really, really cool things with um, with uh, cloud or quantum S approach is that you can define, and I will explain how it does that. You can define how much memory you want to in in average you want to allocate for these small steps because it's this is for independent row files. You can start by allocating, for example, 10 gigabyte of memory, really small node, and then you can go hide, hide, and then have a really big node with, you can start by 70 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, dependently of the size of your experiment for the big processor at the very, uh, very end step. But you don't need a big node allocated for month for the very beginning. You just need small steps, okay? Very well configurable for a small amount of memory, and then a big step that will perform only one task, which is the protein inferior and final quantitation table. At the very end, we also support to MC tab, but also all the file format. And if anyone here listening to this talk is interested to collaborate with us, it's just pin to us. And we can actually try to export to different file formats. I mean, we have now MS tabs, but we can do three clear and so on and so forth. This is for DDA experiment. I mean, I explained the LF, LFQ labor free uh, thread, but this is the same thing if you go for TNT, that is an isobaric analyzer that try to get the isobaric level of every peptide, and then you have the protein inference and the protein quantifier, which are the big nodes. I mean, all these small nodes are the same here, okay? And in DDA, MSDF, this is shared between LFQ and TNT, and the only thing that is different is the how do you quantify? More interesting, I mean, we can perform DIA analysis using Diane, and that's the, the completely different thread because we are for now supporting only DIA um, library free approach, where actually you start by the raw file, where we can actually convert for MCML only for thermal raw file, but if you are using your um, ABSAX or other instrument, you need to convert to MCML yourself. And you don't need to add the decoys. I mean, this decoy step is not shared here. Diane will do that for you. Then in Diane, we use every, every row file is sent to a node. Where Diane will try to predict the in silico library from every node. Um, no, it will generate the in silico library for, uh, for the database. And then we do a pre-analysis uh, of every row file. And then we'll combine this each analysis in the latest step, and then finally have an MC tab, generate an MC tab and uh, MS tabs. I explained this is uh, the uh, this is the general behavior of the workflow, but these are the small steps how this is happening here. And um, um, what is I, actually I, I want to do a stop here about the file format. File format. In, in quantum S are based on, as I say, standard file format. All the output, all the input are based are PSI file format. PSI is the HUPO uh, a standard um, proteomics standard initiative, and they actually is a group of developers, bioinformaticians, biologists, and so on. Then they group all together and define a set of standards in proteomics. The input is actually an SDRF as I explained before, and the output is an MC tab. And this is really important because the MC tab is what contains your results. An MC tab 
is a tab delimiter file format also. It has a first section that contains the metadata of the experiment, a protein section when actually all the reported proteins are, um, are um, written, and then where, for example, in that you have the protein accession, protein description, best search engine score, the, um, and the quantitative values, intensities for every protein across the entire experiment um, for every specific sample. You have then a peptide section when you have all the peptides associated with these proteins, and the final, the PSM sections, when you have all the PSM spectrum associated, peptide spectrum matches, where, where actually for every peptide you have the association between the spectrum and um, the peptide. We also have popular other output format like MSTRATS and TRIPLAY. Okay, let's go now to how you can run this, and that's when things get interesting, okay? Then, as I said, and I have a, a really nice presentation about SDRF, how an SDRF look like, but in the SDRF, you put the configurations of the search. For example, the, the proteomic search, let's say uh, you have the PTMs that would be used for the searching, you have the trip, the enzyme that was used for the cleavage, like in this case, um, uh, tri tripsing, for example, and I put some examples around that. You have, uh, in the, you, you can have also other parameters, more generic parameters, and so on and so forth. Then, how do you run NextFlow? You need to first inst install NextFlow, and I, I will not try to go that, mm, uh, big into NextFlow because there is a lot of information in internet in NextFlow. But in a simple computer or in HPC, you can do something like this and install your NextFlow. NextFlow is the workflow engine that will understand your uh, QuantMS. It will be the one that actually know what kind of engine I'm using for deploying the tool, if it's Docker, Singularity, or Conda. It will be the one that knows what type of uh, computer is I am trying to deploy, or architecture I'm trying to deploy, if in this case it's an HPC, a cloud infrastructure, or my local computer. That is done by Nextflow. I, uh, I can, you can go in the internet and look for Nextflow information and so on. How do you run, I, I will put a really simple example, how do you run QuantMS? You first download QuantMS to your local machine using GitHub clone, and then you download your NextFlow version, uh, your QuantMS uh, workflow, and then you type a command like this. As I said before, this is, uh, is a not a, this is not a desktop tool. This is not something to to run in a computer in a with a desktop environment. Uh, there is some options to run it in desktop environments and so on, but mainly this is for the command line. This is how do you perform an analysis in cloud infrastructure in in HPC, in your uh, common line with large studies. Then you run something. NextFlow is basically that you're running the NextFlow workflow that you run. Main is the, the, the main file of the workflow. A configuration file, I will go in details about how it looks like. A profile, and that's, for example, this is EVI cluster. This I will explain this cloud. This is a profile, how it looks like. The root folder is where this will be exported uh, uh, where the raw data is contained, the input is basically an SDRF, the database that would be used for the data search, add or not decoys, in this case I'm adding the decoys, the search engine that I want to use, MSGF Plus or Comet, uh, a threshold at the PSM level, 1% at DR, or 1% at DR at protein level, and then you run the experiment. Actually, from here you can remove the add decoys if your database has the decoys, and you can even remove the search engine parameters because there is one search engine parameter which by default, which is Comet. And you can also the, the, uh, not provide the PSM uh, threshold or protein threshold because both of them are put at 1% every year, which is actually the standard. I just put here how the common look like. Okay, in this case, let's go in more detail about the common. Here I'm saying I am performing this analysis with EVI cluster profile. In our, in our NextFlow workflow, EVI cluster profile look like this. And this is a, this is a profiles are basically what kind, type of architecture, compute architecture I will be using. I will be using an architecture 
that, con that, that will be using for the container deployment conda, that Docker will not be enabled, will be false, Singularity will be false, and I will be trying to use Mamba to deploy the conda package. If I'm using Docker, I'm mainly, for example, in this case, this is actually my, my way of executing in my local machine, I will be true for Docker, and all the other one will be false, okay? What will happen? Will happen something like this is this is how steps will this is the granularity of the step. That's how things will be thrown into the cluster, uh, into the different steps, and each step would perform one task. Okay, and uh, interesting enough, and I will try to point it out here. For example, in this test, the, this is um, a library generation from from a FASTA file for. Uh, DI experiment analysis, in this step, the first attempt to perform the experiment, to perform that task, failed. And it can fail because of memory, for example. In this case, it's because of memory, because I give to this task, I don't know, 10 gigabytes. I want really this to happen in a small machine. However, for this FASTA file, it cannot happen. It goes out of memory. Nextflow provide a way of retrieve the same task again then what is happening here automatically would try to allocate another node with more memory. Which, for example, you can define the threshold, in this case it's twice of memory that it was in the previous step. Then my name, it, it is trying to run now, and it, it passed actually, in a second node with 20 gigabytes of memory. This is done automatically. And this is really cool because you can go, for smaller steps, you can go from really low memory, incrementally going to have as much tries as you want, depending on the size of the experiment. Then at the very end, and that's what something I was explaining before, you actually have a report, and I will put some examples, real examples about this, about the, si the memory size, how much it takes to run one, one each step. For example, this is MSGF. It takes, for example, quite a lot of RAM to run. But in terms of CPU, for example, I think CPU is slow, smaller than Comet. Comet has a little bit of more CPU, but in terms of run, it's, it's low. With those variables, uh, with a lot of experimentation, you can see really how in your cloud infrastructure, you can use one or the other search engine, or both of them. Then I will, as part of Quantum MS, we release also the QC reports of P multi QC, which is a library. At the very end step, we have a library that released some really nice reports around um, the experiment, what has happened during the uh, uh, experiment. And I will, I will go through throw, throw examples. I will not go into detail. I will explain this with a real example. Finally, this is really important. When you finalize your experiment, Quantum S in the output folder, Will, will actually release a set of folders that contain different type, different output for the analysis. For example, the search engine for comment results, the MSTAT converter uh, results, and so on and so forth. Including for MSTATs, for example, we have all the output of MSTATs, including plots of the volcano plots of differential stress uh, proteins, and so on and so forth. We have used this pipeline into with multiple data sets. Um, Recently, uh, this year, uh, we published uh, a reanalysis of, of uh, multiple cell lines to try to find out ensemble variants, um, uh, ensemble made proteomic uh, non canonical peptides. And this is actually a collaboration with uh, the ATOS group and Rui uh, Branca. You can go and read about how this quantum mess was used. And now we managed to identify, to reanalyze. Um, six data set in prime, more than 65 uh, cancer cell line, 20 million MSMS, um, and, tried, um, and we find out around 2,000 newton peptides uh, that are that were really um, uh, uh, relevant and they are understand. Thanks for uh, to uh, the guys of OpenMS first, Timo and Juliano, who are the main supporters of the tools. Then to Vadim for that, Diane and um, our team. Uh, with this collaboration with Professor Chen um, Min Sei Bai in, in, in the um, uh, Chong Ping Ki Laboratory. But let's go over some examples. Let's go over first about how P multi QC look like. When you finish, 
PMUT QC actually um, is the report of your final experiment. This is how it looks. It looks, this is a real example of PMUT QC. This is the analysis of protein exchange data set PXD004684 and the SDRF I think is the one that I showed before or if not I can try to look for. Um, then at the very beginning you have all them CML uh, files that were used and the sample metadata label MS tab condition replicates and so on. Then you have um, the number of this is a um, DI experiment then you can here have the number of peptides identification, modified peptides, the number of proteins, and as you can see, you is easily um, you can see here for every run, for for example, these two specific runs, you have less, really less peptide ID than the other ones. This is actually really important for you when you finish the experiment. If you want to remove some of the raw files and perform again the experiment, this is actually really helpful for to like a QC to basically see the accuracy or, or, the, or, or the, how the experiment performed. We have the number of peptides per protein, uh, we have the number of MSMF, the pitch distribution, and actually really nice, you can actually see here the number of um, all the peptides identified, and you can actually search by peptide. More interesting, you can see, for example, the average, the best search engine score for every peptide, and you can see actually the average intensity across all the replicate. You can switch here, here with show replicate, high replicates. You can see here um, for every condition under the study, for each sample, the intensity of uh, the peptide on each sample, okay? For each specific uh, uh, replicate. You can see here for every peptide, and this is something you can also see for your proteins, you can go see here, okay, these are, these are my protein of interest. I want to see this protein. And this, for example, for this particular protein, average intensity is this one. It has number five peptides identified. And these are the intensity for this particular data set, for this particular condition, and the intensity for this particular condition. This is really um, beautiful because you can see as a DI experiment, when you have a really nice reproducibility, you can see here that the intensity is more or less the same. Uh, all the replicates, you don't have so many missing values, but you, we can go to another experiment. We can go to um, this is actually this 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 report is in the summary pipeline. Uh, we can go. Um, let me see if I can find a pipeline info. This was a data set that I run before in our cloud infrastructure. As I said, sorry that I didn't have the cloud infrastructure running uh, for the. Uh, training, I have some problems uh, moving the data. Um, okay, this is this is this is the report about my data set. How how, how much it things consume? For example, we have in silico generation, it doesn't consume that, that much uh, CPU in terms of memory. Actually, the AMP preliminary uh, search actually consume quite a lot of memory, and in silico library generation, consume a little bit of memory, you know more or less in general, six gigabyte, two gigabytes of memory consume, and so it's not that really that much, but uh, job duration, for example, in silico generation, for example, library is the one that consume more time, you know, you need to give more time to it, and these are the times where every task was uh, uh, um, performed. Um, then I will go back to here, and then in the MSTATS, you can see, for example, when you have the MSTATS report, and you can go and see and open this volcano plot, this lovely, beautiful volcano plot, when you can see um, all the proteins that were identified, okay? And differential express uh, for this particular uh, data set, okay? Let me try to find out, because I have multiple data sets reanalyzed, and let me try to find out a TMT. Okay, this is a TMT data set, and let's go to summary of the pipeline. And to show you something, because this is actually quite relevant in, in the multi-QC report, this will take a little bit of time. Mm. Okay, then here you have more conditions, you can open here. And see a little bit more condition 
but there is a really nice heat map when actually for every every sample you can see kind of uh, uh, the differences between samples uh, uh, MCML sorry uh, raw files and different different uh, um, variables in this case is contaminants for example the difference between contaminants here and contaminants here is quite quite a lot and then you can here spot what are the samples that actually may be or your runs that actually may be uh, uh, been going wrong during your experiment and this is quite nice because here you have the number of peptides identified uh, um, in the pipeline, number of peptides, proteins identified uh, for every run, number of peptides and proteins but here you can go more in detail, in this case we use MSEF plus and Comet and if you see here MSEF plus identify generally a little bit more proteins that a peptide um, PSM that comet um, um, but it doesn't improve that much I would say the number of uh, final peptides um, but you can see here for example for these fractions okay for these fractions actually the number of PSM is really low compared with this fraction this kind of report is actually quite useful for, for users we have um, other reports that are quite nice like for example correlation of scores I mean you can see the score correlation for decoys and targets how targets and decoys are split across the sample and you can see the same thing for uh, the MSGF plus spectrum values okay which is quite nice and again you can switch uh, let me see if I can see here for example for peptides you see here the same thing about replicates for these peptides across the three conditions remember that norm no, not remember I mean the other talk I was talking about what norms mean for MS stats is actually the pooling of the MS stats okay cool um, let's go to the command line and try to find for example like here running one data set is the DI data set this is how this is um, the example that I put for example this is in my local computer you can run you can download uh, QuantMS from GitHub and um, from the, uh, the I'm using now the development uh, um, version of QuantMS and you can run it with this simple command netflow main, uh, main um, and then you can use uh, netflow config and the netflow config will define some sort of parameters I'm using docker and this is the text, uh, the a test uh, data for TNT, and the output di directory would be in this place. If I say resume, it will start from the previous run that was performed, and this is actually Nextflow will go into. This is running locally in my machine, and I have another one lo running local, and um, in uh, in the HPC. In the HPC, you will see that every step is running here. I'm running at the same time. I'm running 127 jobs, 70% of them has finished and in total they need to run 145 uh, nodes but this um, just one node for them and uh, MCML statistics here this is how this starts and then MS will start triggering this approach because, because these, these uh, steps were successfully before when I say resume, Nextflow will understand that this has finished successfully and then I, need, I can move to the next step because in this case everything has been successful so far I just want to trigger the pipeline in my local machine using the, the command then um, it's trying to basically collect and this always happens it's trying to collect the statistics about the ROM I mean the ROM, uh, everything happened and it's trying to collect the final statistics Okay, I think um, this is a, we kind of stop the presentation here. I hope for the interaction, we, if you have questions, we can actually discuss it more in detail about QuantMS. Uh, please, uh, um, you can talk to us in GitHub. Um, the GitHub of uh, QuantMS is actually um, uh, Big, big, uh, sorry, 
big bio, quite a mess. And this is the development channels. I mean, this is the latest, latest version of QuantMS, the one that we have on the active support. And in here in the discussions, you can type your own questions and interact with the developer team. Thank you for everything and for your attention.